Alright, so today we're going to talk about uh, distributed systems. Uh, first, uh, let's see what we did last session. So we talked about storage uh, reliability. We talked about rate systems, different rate levels from 0 to 6 and also uh, rate 0, 1 and 1, 0. Uh, but we didn't get to talk about I.O. systems. Um, so uh, I hope everyone is like doing well on the PA3 design document. Make sure you submit it uh, this Friday. And uh, I hope you are, again, working on the PA3 implementation. It's, we have reduced the workload, but it's still a project. Uh, so it needs, again, some amount of work before you start like, you know, making some uh, making some progress and getting some score. All right? And uh, keeping on with homework four, you're already done. You can take a look at homework five to see what you can expect in the next couple of sessions. So today we're going to first revisit the I.O. systems that we didn't get to finish last session. And then we're going to talk about distributed systems as an overview. And then we're going to talk about what is event ordering uh, in the you know, context of distributed systems. And we're going to talk about distributed mu uh, mutual exclusion. So if you think that you're done with it, that's not true. Centralized approach, fully distributed approach, token passing. These are different approaches for mutual exclusion. And uh, sometimes in the dis distributed systems, we, we need an election to like elect a coordinator. And we're going to cover two algorithms for that. So these algorithms you should understand and be able to at least you know differentiate or. Um, you know, if you have like an example, you, sh you should be able to go through them. All right. So for I/O systems, uh, this is just like a quick introduction only. Uh, this is not an actual um, embedded system class. Uh, so there are there are many I/O devices on your computer besides basically your CPU and memory, and uh, they are usually. I mean, uh, they, they can be either like, you know, through storage, they can be for uh, used for transmission, such as like network, Bluetooth, whatever. Uh, you have obviously Ethernet, Wi-Fi, um, and uh, human interface devices, which are many, screen, keyboard, mouse, audio, and or some specialized ones, for example, maybe uh, something like a controller that it has like, uh, you know, controls some specific board or something outside of your computer. Now, um, the, the, the needs and uh, the throughput for all of these are very, very different, like up to maybe 12 orders of magnitude uh, different because you have something like mouse which, or keyboard, which is even less than mouse, which has maybe uh, bytes per second only, like, it's just like, you know, your keyboard is like how many keyboard, how many keys per second you can like enter versus something like, a, you know, SSD, which has like gigabits per second, right? And you cannot just like connect all of them to the same bus with the same controllers, with the same speed. Uh, so that's why you have like, uh, you know, different buses on your system, which these, uh, these I.O. devices basically connect to. So a bus is a shared, you know, uh, line and which basically devices use this to transfer data, you know, from back and forth. And you, the transfer is also not actually sending something on the line from here and then here. It's just like uh, a device raising the voltage of the bus up or down, right? So there's a, that depends on the protocol, but usually uh, that's just about it. There is a line and then there's, there should be a, like a bus controller because if one wants to like set it up and then the other one wants to set it down, first of all, the value will be invalid. Second of all, you might just like have to have a, you know, uh, surge through one of, uh, one, from one of them to the other and then one will just, uh, you know, fry or something. So because of all these, there are all type of electronics and hardware controllers to make sure that, you know, people can use bus and share it. And so there are different buses. So you have, we have like PCI bus, which is, you know, used for different PCI slots. And then even in the, uh, there's expansion slot on the PCI. We're going to take a look at the picture on the next slide. And then you have PCI Express, which is used, for example, for your graphics card. Or uh, I think there are some SSDs use uh, PCI Express. It's just like much uh, with higher speed. Hyper transport is the bus between a... Uh, uh, processor and uh, I think the south bridge, uh, which again is like, you know, uh, very, very high speed. And uh, 
so depending on what the device is, you have to like uh, at, at least understand, you know, what what are the concepts, of some of the examples at least here. So this is like the PCI box here, uh, bus here. Uh, the processor is here connected to its own cache, and then there's the memory, and then there's the bridge of our memory controller here, because memory is not just used by the processor anymore. There are other, you know, uh, devices that should be able to use uh, memory, and uh, depending on the architecture, it's a little bit different. So, for example, Intel and AMD, they have different uh, architecture. That's why the motherboard are also specific for AMD, even between them, you know, the, the, they have uh, some uh, sockets that support some processors, but not the other ones of this, uh, they only cover one family. So, uh, I remember like the, there was something called, called Northbridge and Southbridge, and then for AMD now it's like hypertransport. But anyways, um, so then you have like, uh, you know, your graphics controller, which now, now shows and uh, connects to your displays. And then there is a SCSI or SCSI controller, which are like, you know, controllers of some disks. And then, and then there are like uh, legacy or IDE disk controllers, which are like, you know, the magnetic disks. Uh, and then again, each of them are controllers. So you don't, you don't necessarily see them because most of them are on your motherboard uh, itself. And uh, so, and then you have like, you know, expansion bus interface for this, uh, slower devices such as, you know, keyboard, uh, parallel port, stereo port. These are very, very slow co compared to, you know, something like graphic controller or PCI Express. So uh, that's why they, they have a hub. Now through, the, through one PCI, for example, there is a, like a USB hub, which then gives you different USB ports. You don't connect all of them to the same hub, uh, to the same bus. All right? So... Basically, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these actually use something which is called a controller, which is a, a, you know, a, a chip or some electronics that basically control a bus or a port or device. And it, it uses, uh, it, it's, it, it, they usually are uh, more than just very basic electronics. So some, some might be a little bit simpler, like serial port controller. Serial port controller is easy. You have only TX and RX. There are certain things that you can write to it, and then you just like you know read. But there are things, uh, more complex ones. For example, the SCSI bus controller itself can handle basically many SCSI devices. Now, for each of those, it should be able to control the bus uh, on this side and on this side. And uh, it, it, it's obviously you know each of these devices are not like you know simple devices such as just RX and TX. So uh, then. The devices themselves also might have controllers. So, for example, your hard disks have controllers on them, which helps, you know, basically gives the ability to, you don't need to micromanage them. You can give them higher order commands, and then they handle them. Or they manage, for example, bad sectors or caching or whatever, right? Your hard disk drive has a cache. Who handles that cache from the block readings and everything, right? It has a controller on itself, which then responds to higher level commands, right? So, but now how a CPU can control I.O., like, you know, all the devices and everything, eventually there should be an instruction on the memory, and the CPU should read that instruction, run that instruction, and then something happens, right? So, uh, there are I.O. instructions specific for I.O.s, and uh, these, we're going to take a look at. The, this has been, like, very, like, since the beginning of the, you know, processors, basically, there are specific uh, instructions called I.O., and um, even I.O. bus and memory bus was in, I think, 80, 86 versions uh, of, you know, Intel processors, very old. So they had, like, uh, they, half of the me uh, memory address line was shared between I.O. and memory, and then half of it was just, like, for memory. Uh, and then since then, the, 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 there were, like, I.O. instructions involved. And then the, you can also memory map uh, I.O. Uh, we're going to take a look at that. And uh, some controllers basically can have both. So, for example, the difference is I.O. instructions usually are a little bit slower because they were initially meant for, you know, I.O.s were, like, slower than uh, memory. And... Uh, so, uh, but for something like, you know, graphics card, you cannot just, like, use a lot of, like, I.O. instructions for each of the pixels, right? That just doesn't make sense. That's just going to be very slow. So, instead, there are memory mapped I.O. So, a part of the memory address space of uh, CPU is 
shared or basically used by this I.O. So uh, the, the, they use both. So basically CPU will write its uh, whatever that the, the graphics uh going to be shown, it's going to be basically written to an address of memory, which then is uh, accessed by the, your graphic controller. But then there are certain instructions that the CPU can communicate with the graphics controller itself, not just like, you know, transferring the pixels, but maybe, I don't know, the sync of uh, the f refresh rate or changes in the modes or whatever, you know, changing the resolution, whatever that is. So uh, that's why there are the... I.O. controllers that have, uh, that use memory mapped I.O., they also can use the instructions for, for I.O. Um, to be able to, you know, make things simple. Uh, because I.O. instructions are more direct, whereas the memory mapped uh, is less direct. It's just like, uh, you can memory map I.O. even uh, directly, but I think that's not how it is done, at least in some cases like that. All right. So let's take a look at here. So... These are the I.O. address ranges of, uh, you know, some of the devices. So, and there are a lot of these are just like legacy. They're, so even though you don't use parallel ports, this is just reserved because it has been like that and then you're never going to change that. I actually don't know till when they're going to keep it like that. But um, So, the, again, the I.O. address range is different than memory address range. So, the same address between I.O. and memory can mean different things. So, for example, these addresses, I think, in memory are for uh, interrupt vectors. And uh, so these two are for, you know, interrupt controller. So th th this is just different. Again, because the instructions are different and the, the, the way that CPU actually puts addresses on the bus is also different because there's a one pin which is specific for I.O. or memory. So if there's an I.O. instruction, that line is going to be pulled up, if I'm not wrong, uh, or down. And then if it's a memory address, if it's one to load or store, it's going to be the opposite of that. So that's why it basically gives you the, you know, the two separate address space. And uh, so when the I.O. is up or down, then the I.O. controllers who are basically listening to I.O. instructions uh, will basically listen to the address line uh, if it's the, the I.O. memory is uh, pointing to memory, that means the CPU wants to address a memory, so all the I.O. controllers who are only responding to I.O. instructions will just like be, you know, uh, will ignore it. So, uh, again, these are all happening in hardware, so it's just like, you know, there are gates that just like make this. There, up to some point, it's just like not, not no uh, control. It's just like uh, they're, 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 they're enabled or, or disabled. And uh, so, yeah, uh, now there are different uh, typical approaches to I.O. devices. Uh, again, these are simple, just, you know, have an idea of them. So you can do some uh, pr uh, procedures on the I.O. devices. You can either read some data from them, write some, uh, some data to them, uh, check their status or, you know, control them. So you can see them in many uh, uh, I.O. controllers. So, for example, take a serial bus controller uh, or, uh, or serial device controller. Then uh, you have a, a serial, usually have a, like an RX and TX, which is used to receive serial data or send serial data. And uh, so in the status register, you can always, like, you know, check with an instruction to... They, they have... The, these are registers, right? So this, these chips... Uh, they are connected through the bus, uh, you know, to the CPU. But inside of them, they, they, again, they have, like, different addresses which point to different registers, right? So, for example, here, when we say, like, you know, from 20 to 21 is interrupt controller. Now, if you address 20, you are talking to interrupt controller, uh, you know, for example, interrupt register. If you're uh, basically pointing to this address, then you are talking to the control register of the interrupt controller, right? And basically, they can tell what you want to do. Now, uh, these are, again, just like registers in the, in the device, and uh, depending on how they have been designed, and obviously the, con the, the driver, the, the code that the CPU is running, the behavior is defined, right? So, for example, let's say this has like four registers, totally independent, and if you read from this address, that is a register, and the device, when sees that uh, address is uh, on the bus, 
then it knows that, oh, the CPU wants to read the data that I have been, you know, receiving from the Rx. So it just, like, puts that on the bus and then let it, uh, let the CPU read it. If the CPU is addressing this register, then it knows that, oh, it wants to, you know, addre uh, address the da data out register. So I will listen to whatever the CPU is, like, sending, and then I will send that on the TX uh, or put it in the buffer. If this uh, status register usually contains, you know, bits of, you know, whatever, like, you know, the flags of the status, so you can say, for example, you can just read the register for one byte, and then, you know, one byte is, like, if the TX buffer is empty, so then the CPU can tell, am I able to put the next data or not, so that you don't overwrite the previous data. So you, you, know, you, you usually check the status. Before actually reading the data, you actually check, oh, uh, you know, you read the status register and based on that bit, you, you will be able to tell if there is data coming or not, or um, the, the, something like that. So control register is also, you, usually uh, you can write to it and then configure the device, such as, you know, the baud rate, uh, the, you know, parity bits, for example. These are, you know, simple examples for a serial controller. Yes? That depends. That totally depends on the device, the behavior, and as well as uh, uh, the, what the device is and the driver. So it's just like all protocols. So whenever you want to like work with a device, you have to understand what are the resistors, what is the typical way to do it, and because they have all the features that you, you can think of, right? So one of the very complex ones that I liked a lot was the interrupt controller in uh, the Intel. If you take a look at it, it's just like amazing how they, I, it just like seems that they didn't want to like, you know, any hardware bit or hardware gates to go to waste. So they defined so many features and they're actually, when you actually learn uh, what they do, it's just like amazing. Uh, but again, it, it's just like, it's the protocol. So if you have an I squared C device, right, you have a bus, and then you have like an address. Now, you can only write or read from, you know, I squared C bus device addresses, but what that means is all the protocol that is defined by the, you know, manufacturer of the device, as well as the device controller, the, the driver that should do that, right? So, you, we can take a look. So, if the data is ready, for example, it might like, you know, post an interrupt. Then the CPU sees the interrupt, but it doesn't know what the interrupt is. So, it, was, it should check. What is the interrupt for? Then it will say, oh, the interrupt is because the data that you previously sent me, now it's like sent out, so I'm free, you can send me another data. Or I sent you an interrupt because another data is like incoming, so you should read it. You know, two different meanings. So uh, there are two methods for I.O. communications when you say like every second, this is one of them. So you can either poll the device or, you know, use the interrupt. These are two different approaches for that. So polling is now every often I go and check this and then see if anyone was waiting for me or not, right? That's just like polling. Again, like in my office hours, sometimes I do that, right? Because I'm not sure if the door is closed, if you can come in or whatever. So, interrupt is just like I'm waiting here, I'm just doing, I don't care, unless someone knocks on the door and, you know, gets my attention. Then I'll go there, right? There are benefits and uh, basically pros and cons, right? So, polling is very simple because the, it's all happening in your software every now and often, every loop, once in a loop, every once, uh, I mean, the second itself is the timer interrupt, but... You get the idea. Every now and often, you will, in the software, decide that, okay, I'm in a stage that I'm done with this. Okay, let's check, you know, next person, right? Um, the interrupt, however, is uh, a little bit more complex because it can just, like, come asynchronously in the middle of something. You have to have, like, interrupt controller. You have to have, you know, be able to jump to your interrupt handler and then come back to wherever you left. And now you have to manage whatever. You should not be in a, you know... Uh, critical section, all this has to be managed, but on the other hand, like, polling wastes a lot of time, how many times I should go there and no, no one is there, right, uh, so it's just like wasting my time, uh, especially if it's something like very frequent, or on the other hand, if I just come back and then someone is like, right now, they have to wait for the next loop, so if it's not, if something is like timely critical, polling is not a very good idea, if I increase the polling rate, not to keep them waiting, then I'm wasting more time. But the interrupt, on the other hand, is just like, you know, they signal me right away. I don't have to waste time, but handling it is a little bit more difficult. All right? So, uh, a polling, uh, the interrupt is basically, procedure is like that. 
Polling is simple, I guess, like you can just like check the status, whatever, and then, so the, uh, the interrupt is uh, like this. You already have like worked with interrupt, for example, in your timer, interrupt handler, but, so CPU is just whatever, uh, you know, if, if it's an I.O. device, it just initiates the I.O. and then, so, you know, for example, sends the data out to a transfer, and then it keeps on working, and then when the, when the data is like sent out, the device uh, like interrupts the CPU, and the CPU like catches this, yeah, they're just like, you know, some uh, phrases. So it raises the interrupt, the CPU catches the interrupt, meaning it realizes that an interrupt is there if it's not masked. And once it catches it, it jumps to the interrupt vector, it jumps to the interrupt handler, which has been defined for that specific interrupt number, and then dispatches the interrupt handler, which is, a, again, a code that you have been prepared on the memory, such as an interrupt, uh, timer interrupt handler in your Pintos. And then where it gets cleared, it gets addressed, it says, oh, like I'm actually addressing, servicing this interrupt. So it like resets the interrupt uh, line or bit. And then, then your CPU jumps back to wherever it was doing. Okay, it resumes. So the interrupts are maskable and non-maskable. Some of the interrupts are maskable, meaning you can just ignore them for the time being. If I'm like, you know, uh, finishing something critical, I don't want to be interrupted. I'm, the masking is just like putting headphones on and then, uh, you know, doing whatever you want, and then unmask it whenever you want. Now, the difference is when you take it off, you will be notified right away that there is an interrupt in the meantime, right? It's not just like you miss it. When an interrupt is there, it latches. It, it latches until it gets serviced, um, but you can mask it for several instructions or even, you know, longer times and you have already disabled some, you know, interrupt, right? Uh, there are non-maskable interrupts as well, so some, some of the interrupts are non-maskable, so it's a, such as the power loss. If the power loss, we talked about in the last session, uh, there is an interrupt for that, but it's not maskable. Or uh, software interrupts, uh, for example, division by zero. If your, one of the instructions causes the CPU to div divide a number by zero, well, what do I do? What is, what is this result? The CPU can, so there is a division by zero interrupt, and whatever happens, it just goes to that vector and then, you know, gets to the uh, software that is written, okay? So, uh, then there, there is a direct memory access, which is DMA. So, let's say if the CPU wants to read a lot, like, you know, one megabyte or two megabytes of data from the hard drive, to a memory. Uh, that doesn't make sense for the CPU to just like wait and pull on the hard disk drive because, you know, like, you know, sends, a, sends one command and then read one block and then put it in the buffer and then again the next block and the next block and then the CPU is, you know, has more important things to do, right? So the DMA is like a specific controller which is basically for this, for direct transferring of data without the intra uh, interference of the CPU. So it offloads uh, this the, the, there, there is obviously a driver that should make use of this DMA chip, but the idea is that you offload this to DMA, you tell it that, hey, I want some of the data from that hard drive to this buffer, and then the CPU goes back to its own work because it has cache, it has, you know, in the meantime, it may access the uh, process, uh, the memory for itself. At some points that the, the DMA is actually accessing the memory, the CPU should basically wait a little bit, but that's overall it's usually beneficial because again most of the time CPU is accessing its own cache and so the way to do it is that the, the, the driver basically sets up some commands in the memory and then asks the DMA controller that here is the information on the memory go ahead and then the DMA controller itself accesses the memory directly without the help of the CPU the DMA also has access to the memory line itself so it can basically hold or, or basically put, you know, dibs on the memory address line, and then that's why, like, you know, CPU has to wait because they have the dibs. And now the DMA controller is a little bit smart. It can tell, okay, you know, what is it to be done? I need to, like, transfer some data from here to here, and what is the number of the, you know, bytes? And then it can just, like, do that automatically. So it can tell the, the, for example, the disk controller that, okay, give me one block, and when, it, when it's ready, it puts on the memory, then the next block, then the next block, and all the way till it's over. And then once it's done, it interrupts the CPU that, hey, you know, the, the job that you wanted is over. 
So here is the procedure. So the device driver is told to transfer disk data to buffer some, uh, at some address. And then the device driver tells the disk controller to transfer C bytes from disk to buffer. But now it doesn't actually need the help of the CPU because now this has been uh, offloaded to the DMA bus. Now, the disk controller initiates DMA transfer. The disk controller says, okay, the first block, the block that you asked, it's ready. Do you want it? And then the DMA bus, based on this uh, DMA uh, request, uh, where is that? Here. Uh, it's, oh, it's here. DMA acknowledges, it, it, it basically latches the memory address line and says, okay, now I acknowledge you you can just like put the data of, of your first block to the memory. And then, then the disk controller basically puts that, those data into the memory. Then the DA, and then also basically clears the DMA request line, this one. So then the DMA now changes, uh, goes to the, uh, checks the uh, rest of its own commands and says, okay, now I still, I, you know, changes the disk block, changes the uh, buffer address, and then, uh, then the, the controller now is told, the, the disk controller is told now to prepare the block number two. And then again, when it's like prepared, when the, the data is ready, it sends a request to DMA that, hey, a block number two is ready. Then the DMA fixes the, ad, uh, the memory address line for itself, then acknowledges the disk. The disk co copies the uh, block number two to the memory. And then again, Next one. So it all goes on and on till the count is zero. Then the DMA can uh, interrupt the CPU that, you know, the whole thing is over. So in the meantime, the CPU is you know, just like uh, whenever that they're not using the memory, the CPU can use the memory for its own, you know, uh, for another process. All right. Any question in this? All right. So let's move on to... Distributed systems. Um, a distributed system, obviously, I mean, the idea is a collection of loosely coupled processes that, because you can also have like multiple processes, uh, multiple processes, but tightly coupled. Uh, and then basically sharing memory. So these are not sharing memory, memory and then they're communicating over a network, right? And uh, the reasons for a distributed system is that you can resource, uh, you can resource share. You can speed up your processes. You can basically, you know, increase the capacity of your data. You can uh, add redundancy. You can uh, access remote files. There are some, you know, the, the, the divide your data or pr processes basically among different sites. Or, for example, using remote specialized hardware. So if you are working here and there is a, like a special server in a different university that has access to some, uh, not just data, but maybe equipment, then, you know, distributed systems uh, allow you to, you know, just work here seamlessly as if you're working with that, that equipment right here, okay? And uh, so the a distributed operating system's goal is basically to make it happen so that the users are not aware of this. They're just like, you know, using the system as if, you know, you, you just like have access to everything. Just like your, you know, your Google Drive or, you know, when you use it, you don't know which device you're using, which server you're reading from, where is your data, you don't care. And uh, you, you should be able to migrate the data. So if you are accessing some data that is like on a remote site, the operating system, remote, distributed operating system, should basically handle this by, you know, transferring the data you need or pre uh, prepare the data, the, the whole file that you might need, or just like in the real time, uh, the parts of uh, the data that you were working on, or uh, computation migration. So, you know, at some point, you might use Amazon Web Services, right? Or other distributed systems that are basically, you, you're offloading processes to them. Again, you, you don't, it's like done seamlessly, but this is the job of the operating system, to be able to migrate the processes, for different reasons, for example, if the data is there, instead of like, you know, bringing all the data here and then doing something here, it just like makes sense to get, take the process over there and then run the process and then maybe, you know, transfer the results. Or uh, maybe just, you know, resource. Maybe the, you have like better resources somewhere, so if you can take the process from here to somewhere else, it just like runs faster, okay? And uh, so a process migration, uh, the other reasons also is like a hardware preference. Again, process execution may, may require a specialized processor. 
So let's say if you're working on some near, you have like a you know stupid device here that doesn't have floating point operations, right? So if your process needs a floating point operation, it just makes sense to transfer it somewhere else that has it, okay? Or software preference, maybe you know on this device you don't have many softwares that might require or you know code that you may need, but it it might exist somewhere else, so it just like makes sense to transfer the process over there, and. Uh, yeah, so let's see. The distributed file system, again, these are just like overview and motivation behind the files, uh, the distributed systems. Uh, we are not going to talk about any of them specifically in details. So distributed file system is something like, you know, like on Google Drive. It's just like implementation of classic uh, time sharing model of file system, but on, you know, different devices. So you have like many storage devices on, maybe on remote sites, but the distributed file system allows you to basically, gives you the same API. Like, you know, if you're thinking of, okay, I want to store one file, you manage where you want to divide it, where you want to store it, where you want to get a backup or whatever, I don't care. I want this file to be stored and I want to retrieve it, right? Um, and some of it, it obviously is to increase the capacity so you know you don't have to care about your local storage when you have like something like a cloud storage uh, some is uh, for reliability again you have like backups and uh, let's see next, next one now, the network topologies for distributed system. When you have like different computers or servers or, you know, systems basically connected to each other, there are different ways that they're connected. One may just like have something like this, which is fully connected. So each site is connected to the other one directly. Um, this is maybe, I don't know, maybe, yeah. This is just a topology. I don't know if, I don't have an exact answer to this. Uh, but if you have like maybe, I don't know, three or four computers, you can actually do that. But as you increase the number of processes or sites, it just like becomes impossible to connect everyone directly to the other one, right? There are partially connected networks such as I think, you know, the whole internet is just like that. Uh, you, you have to go through some nodes eventually to get to the other ones. There are star networks which is like have a center uh, controller and then the other one. So if you have uh, an office, uh, usually there's like a, you know, server that everyone is connected to or a switch or a uh, router device that everyone is connected to that and then they are connected. So even like in, in your home network, you have your router, so everyone is directly connected to that. So even if you we want to like, you know, uh, play something on your TV, your data from your phone goes to the router, then to the TV, right? And then there are three structured networks. Uh, I don't have any example for this, but the idea is just like, you know, you have uh, hierarchical, so if you, you know, these are a family, they don't have to, you know, go through A or E or F, they can just like, you know, uh, communicate here. This basically takes a lot of like extra, uh, traffic from going to, you know, places that you don't care. So if you know that these are like gonna communicate a lot together, it's just like makes more sense to put them on the, you know, on this side. Uh, then there are ring networks, which are, you know, uh, connecting like a ring, logically or physically. And uh, we're going to talk about, for example, a couple of examples on this one. So, the, an example we're going to cover quickly. No, nah, okay. Yeah, quick, relatively quickly is Google. So, it's just like, you know, you can go through these numbers. Uh, they're just like mind-blowing, you know. If you, even if you think that, you know, they have like one million machines, which they, have, they definitely have more. They have like about like at least six full football fields of, you know, space just for the racks and basically what they use is like the 10 million bucks per month. They're just like, just for the power, for powering and cooling of these racks. Again, this is very, very conservative uh, estimation. And uh, so it's just like, you know, the scales of data centers. You can check these numbers for, you know, Google, Facebook. These, they're just like, uh, all of them, they're just like crazy. So um, again, there are hundreds of computers uh, hundreds of racks in each of these sites, each of them. Uh, there are, I don't know how many actual sites they have, um, but anyways, whenever you have like a, you know, single Google search request, your request actually is handled by hundreds of computers, not just like, you know, one or it's just like doesn't make sense because the way that you, the web is, you know, so vast and then you, you cannot just like have all of it cached in every one of them so that, 
every one of them is available for your request only or other requests. So, an example that we're going to cover is like how your search request is actually handled. And uh, it starts from your DNS routing that basically handles your request to a close uh, Google web server. Um, depending on the load or whatever, they, they are smart. Some of them are just like implemented in hardware, real time. They can make the decisions like that. So, uh, a, a cluster consisting of a Google ser uh, web servers. Now, each Google web server handles some requests, right? When you, your HTTP request eventually gets handled by one Google web server, right? Now, inside this cluster, there are many index servers and doc servers and uh, other servers like, you know, specific to ads, spell checking, whatever. And each of them are standalone computers. They're rack mounted. There are thousands of them. There's not one like, you know, super computer of web server that handles everything. No, it's just like, because it doesn't make sense after some point that, you know, the amount of money and resources and just technology that you have to put to increase your capacity is just like goes up like that. So it just doesn't make sense. So, then within the cluster itself, the, there's a load balancing that routes your search to a tightly loaded Google web server. Again, there, there are many of these servers there. Now, a load balancer right there, it can handle the con incoming requests to some of these servers. Now, that server now be, will be your server. So, it, that will basically uh, do your search and then eventually makes the response to you, okay? Now, so this is going to be that for now. So, what this is the, doing is now the index of the web, like, you know, whenever you're searching uh, the web, the, 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 the web or pages that the, they are, like, searching, they're indexed, right? And uh, obviously, with a lot of metadata, they're not just, like, searching your key phrase or something all in, you know, in, in every text. That's just, like, not possible. So, uh, the index is, like, partitioned into, like, something called shards. And <clears throat> each of these are a subset of the docs, right? So, based on some category, they just, like, you know, separate these. And each of these shards is, rev uh, again, like, specific for some criteria or topic, let's say, right? Now, each of these shards are <clears throat> replicated into many computers. So, many computers are just for, you know, index of this shard. Many computers are now replicating a different shard of indexes. Many computers, again. Now, what happens is that this Google web server <clears throat> routes your search to one index server associated with each shard. So, among these computers, uh, I'm just going to pick you and, um, you know, search for, uh, this is the search that you're going to do uh, on these shards that are, again, many, many computers. I'm going to pick you based on your balance and I'm just going to give this to you and then you search. So, all different shards of, uh, you know, computers, uh, they will be handling uh, one of them. And then that computer, again, like, there are, like, back and forth information. And once the indexes are basically searched, then the result is an ID for every doc satisfying your search rank ordered by relevance, right? So, there are, again, you don't need to see anything yet. The Google server just has some IDs for shards, right? Uh, so, based on your search, this, this server says, okay, this is not relevant to me at all, the, or the documents that I index. This may say, okay, the, the, the search actually is relevant to the documents that I, you know, index. Uh, and then, basically, you only have the IDs. Now, you have to actually check the document servers themselves. Now, these themselves also are partitioned into shards. So, and a simple idea is that uh, the hash ID on that doc. So, whatever that uh, ID is generated by the index, uh, you hash it, and then you realize what are the, what are the doc servers that I need to, you know, search for that specific uh, index. And again, they're also multi, uh, uh, replicated, and each of them are holding some, some subset of the docs. So let's say this this is uh, keeping the documents for news. This one is like for scientific web websites. This one is like you know for whatever. And uh, so the, again, the web server now has the IDs and ranks. So basically, now it sends a request to the doc servers. Now the doc servers also keep like searching and you know. Uh, giving uh, the results back to the Google web server here. And now that when everything is done, this web server is basically sorting them out, generating an HTML, uh, you know, giving it one URL 
title summary for every of those documents and then, you know, prepares that. And in the meantime, the spell checker, ad server and everything, and they're also, you know, doing their separate job in parallel. And then that's why you also, you know, parts of the web would be, you know, your ads uh, or, or the uh, recommendation for a spell checker and everything. And this is just like, a, you know, and then the Google web server just like, you know, gives, it, gives that to you. And then, you know, you download that, you see those results on your uh, browser, right? And again, this just like happens in milliseconds. And uh, they're doing this by these, okay? So the, the, the data is like, you know, vastly distributed and parallel. Uh, all this, again, one server cannot do all, all of this. That's why they have to handle like this parallelism, how to replicate what parts, how to basically do this indexing, how to like, uh, you know, keep the information. And again, they, they don't have supercomputers. They cannot just like handle that. They're just going to be so expensive. Instead, they're going to like, you know, use cheap components, just like, you know, normal computers. However, uh, obviously again, like last session we, we mentioned, if you have one computer and it lasts for five years, if you have uh, you know, millions of computers, how you can, you cannot just like buy all new and then expect them all to work for five years and then again replace all of them at the same time. It's just like not working, right? They just like happen to fail and replace, fail and replace. And uh, so what handles this is the software. So the distributed softwares handle this. Uh, they are, you know, making it fault tolerant. So, you know, if the hardware fails, or well, it just doesn't, you know, fail the whole system. And it keeps it available, even if a site fails, again, you, you, the whole, you know, Google doesn't go down. Uh, it makes it recoverable. The failures, you can always happen, so you should be able to recover from them. And it makes it scalable, obviously. And that's how, like, it's just, like, growing and growing and growing. And obviously, you know, the security uh, for both in, in hardware or in software security, okay? So uh, now we get to distributed coordination. Now, now when you have like a many devices or many s nodes on a system, how can you coordinate? How can because you are assuming that you know they they, they are connected now? How they can manage? Uh, who can tell like what should be done? Uh, there is always coordination needed between the nodes, and the problem is when you have like you know ordering of events and achieving synchronization. So it's easy in a local machine. You have you have like one clock. And that clock propagates. You can like have it on one process, uh, one processor, or more than one processor in the same system. It's easy to manage synchronization with signaling, right? But that just can't happen in hardware, uh, in in distributed systems, because you know the latency is like so much, and the different clocks. You know, one machine's clock is different than the other. Like the speed of the clock is also different. Like you cannot just like rely on that. So what what helps us here is something which is called happened before relationship, and this is like this helps uh, partial ordering. So if you know that one event has happened before the other one, you can have an idea of you know some order. Like it gives you at least okay you know this order before that, and uh, this can help you out with the synchronization. So. Um, for example, one of just like, you know, idea is that if you want to estimate the latency, you can just ping and then you know that, okay, when I send my message, then it will be received by the receiver. This will happen definitely after that. And then if they send me back the message, that will happen after that. So if I, you know, send a message and then it comes back after a second, I can be sure that, you know, the message took at most one second, and then the latency, I got to do it for multiple times, and then I have an estimate, okay, that maybe the latency is half a second, you know, one way. And this is just like a simple idea of, you know, because of the ordering, you can make this decision. If, if, if I can make independent messages to, to the receiver, they can also send me independent messages. There is no way I can tell which message was sent before the other one, because I, I can't tell, but there's no ordering. If I say something, may, it may go through different routes, you can send me a message from a different route. I cannot tell which message was sent first, right? Uh, but if I know that you only send message after receiving my message, then I can tell that, all right? So again, these are just like uh, minimal ideas about these. There's, if you are still in, you know, next semester here, there's distributed uh, systems course if you want to take it, obviously. 
But, uh, so this happened before a relation, uh, we're going to talk about it briefly here. We denote it by an arrow, and this event, any event, uh, if, you, if there's an arrow between A and B, that means like A happened before B. Okay, so there are different things. For example, in the same process, maybe there are two events. Maybe sending or receiving a message, right? Or uh, running parts of the uh, you know, execution. So, because the, the process uh, the, is like you know, a, sequen- a sequence of instructions or events, basically, you can always tell something like that. A happened before B. Now, uh, if A is an event of sending a message by one process, and then B is the event of receiving the same message on a different process, then again, this holds. Always you can say (coughs) A happened before B. Now, uh, and if A and B uh, have a happened before relationship like that, and B and C also have a happened before relationship, then you can tell also A happened before C. Right? This is just like obvious, right? Now, only with these three assumptions, you can make partial ordering, and uh, basically some algorithms are based on these to even, I think, uh, achieve total ordering. So, <clears throat> if they are not, if two events are not, you know, that, you know, they don't have this relation, then what you, can, then what you will say is that they, are, they execute concurrently. Now, this is not exactly like concurrent in real time. There is no real time anymore here. We don't have a synchronization. We don't have a single clock. That's the, that's the whole problem and idea here. So you stay concurrently because you don't know if they happened before the other one. There is no way that you can tell this was before this one. And because of that, you assume that they are running at the same time and you can't, you know, uh, you can't uh, make any conclusion based on if you, if, if you think A happened before B or B happened before A, all right? So let's take a look at the example here. So let's say we have like three processes, P, Q, and R, right? And this is the timeline. So within each process, always the timeline exists, right? Like that's obvious. So P0, like whatever happened, like, you know, in P, all happened before P1. And P1 happened before P2. P2 happened before P3 and so on. The same goes for Qs and also for Rs. Now, there are message passings between these processes, right? Let's say at, the, at this point, P1 sends a message and it is received by Q at this point. Again, there is no global clock to see what is this time. You only can tell that P1 happened before Q2. Now, can you tell P0 happened before Q1? No, because there is no happened before relationship between them. And that's why you, 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 you're going to say they have, they're running in concurrent. The same goes with P0 and R2. But you can tell P0 happened before R4. No matter what your time and synchronization, you can tell R4 was after P0. Because P0 was before P1, P1 was before Q2, Q2 was before Q3, and Q3 was before R4. And so, for, and so you can tell P0 happened before R4. Okay? So, uh, these are some of the examples. So, which of the following event orderings are true? So, P0 and P3, is it true? Yes, because always in the same process you have this relationship. Oh, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Copy and paste issue. Alright, so, but you get the idea. I'm going to update this in the uh, slide. But any uh, path that you can find with the happen before relationship with, the, you know, these arrows, then that's true. If not, it's not. It's just like concurrent. Sometimes the arrows are a little bit misleading. So there might be a relationship that you just like can't see right away. Uh, so just make sure. Or vice versa. So for example, this one. P1 uh, goes to Q2, but then P4 is here. So did Q2 happen before P4? Yes or no? You can't tell. There is no happen re- before relationship between the Q2 and P4. Maybe P1 to P4 was really quick, and then this message took a long time to receive here. You can't tell. 
right? So, the idea is simple, she should be able to tell that, right? So, uh, which of the following statements are true? P2 and Q2 are concurrent processes, P2 and Q2. Is there any relationship, uh, happen before relationship between these two? No, so they're concurrent. Q1 and R1, is there any relationship between Q1 and R1? No, so they happen, they're, they're running in concurrent. P0 and Q3, is it dying? Uh, P, uh, sorry, P0 and Q3. P0 is here, Q3 is over there. So, there is a happened uh, before relationship between them. Uh, P, no, R1 and P0. Can anyone tell me is that true or not? Hmm? R0, uh, R0 and P, P0. Obviously, there is not. Okay, that's better. R0 and P4, R0 and P4, again, there's no, so they're running in concurrent, okay? Uh, okay, so now, what you can do with this, what you can help this, I mean, make, make use of this happen before relationship, is that you basically assign a timestamp in each of them, and you can tell whenever you're, you know, uh, within a process, whenever an event is happening after the other one, you increase your timestamp. This timestamp is logical. This is not a real-time clock, right? These are events orderings. So, if, this, if the timestamp is here is zero, then I'm moving into one. Then next event is two. Just as simple as that. It doesn't matter how, much, how long it takes. It's just like an order, right? Now, I will always know that this happened after that because the number is large, right? Now, if uh, two processes have... Uh, basically send each other a message, their orders are different. At a real time here, I may be in event number two, they might be in event number five. I don't know, they don't know what's going to happen, right? So instead, when they send a message, the message also contains their timestamp. So at, they say, okay, I'm uh, at timestamp number five, I'm, I'm sending you this message. Now I'm at number two, and I receive the message. I look at the message and says, oh, they are at number five. So, in order to preserve the, you know, happen before relationship, I am going to make this 6. Instead of, I'm just going to ignore 3, 4, 5, and then, so they send the message on 5, and I'm receiving it, receiving it on 6. So, this way, if the, if the timestamps of two uh, events are, you know, the same, they, they're running in concurrent, and this gives you some partial event, uh, some partial order. It not always makes... Uh, sense. Uh, so, again, it's not total ordering. So, this way you can tell that this happened before this, this happened before that. But if it's on different processes, so for example, again, I'm at number two, they're at number five. Are they ahead of me or no? This we can't tell. But it gives partial ordering for some, some events that are like, you know, again, just like this. Okay, so an example again is like this. If the logical clock for A is 200, the B is like, you know, 195, and then A send a message to B, then the B will just skip through to 201. Okay? <coughs> so, uh, now we're going to get to the, the mutual exclusion. So, the same idea of mutual exclusion what we had was here. So, they <coughs> each of the processes or nodes basically can have a critical section and they want to enter it at different, uh, you know, sites and when they want to enter, the requirement is that each of them in the critical section, then no other process should enter their critical section. Now, this is going to be very difficult when, uh, when you don't have the synchronization, you know, as before, okay? You don't have even uh, the, t the time. So, what everything is going to happen is with the help of message passing, right? So, there are... Uh, Three approaches that we're going to cover for to ensure this that they, they don't enter their critical section without you know the permission from the others, right? So the centralized approach is simple to understand. You have uh, a, you know a master or a center process or node that co coordinates everything, right? So it's like you know you want to go, you want to enter your critical section. You ask them that okay, I want to enter in my critical section. Then they have like you know, they are synchronized with their own self, obviously, so they know what are the order of incoming requests. Then they say okay, you can enter your critical section at this point. Then they wait for the result or you know finishing or release, and then the next one. 
and then the next one, and the next, right? So this is simple to understand and even implement, but the problem with that is that you have a single point of failure. If your coordinator now has a failure, what's going to happen? Then everyone is just going to be, you know, on their own, and then they, they, they cannot, like, coordinate, right? So this is the only problem with that, and so one of the solutions is that you actually take this uh, approach, but you uh, assign a new coordinator every time that this happens, right? Uh, and the election process also, we have it uh, here. So another one is a fully distributed approach. In this case, you basically, whenever you want to uh, enter your critical section, you generate a timestamp and then send the message to everyone, right? Hey, I, at this point, I want to, you know, enter my critical section. Now, if you receive a request, you can either reply that, you know, give the thumbs up or just wait, Waiting means thumbs down. So I, as long as I don't hear the thumbs up from everyone, I, I won't enter my critical section. This is assuming not, you know, failure in the midway or something. There are some assumptions that should be made or at least implemented partially to avoid, uh, you know, issues. So, or let, let's say we're assuming at least the, the messages are not lost on the way. You know, when you send the message, it is being received. So we assume this here. And uh, when, when you receive a message, you can uh, either, uh, here, you can do this. If, if uh, the, the decision by process J to the reply, uh, to the request of process I, you can defer it or, uh, you know, reply immediately. So if you are already in your critical section and then you hear, uh, you know, request to the, you know, I, they want to uh, enter the critical section, I don't care, I'm already in my critical section, so you got to wait. So you don't actually reply, you let it finish, and then you may reply it, right? You defer it. So if I don't want to enter my critical section, then I don't care. Whoever wants to, you know, enter the critical section, I'm just going to give my thumbs up to everyone, right? Now, if I want to enter my critical section, they also want to critical section. Now there's a kind of a tie. Now you have to break the tie. So we're going to take a look at the timestamp, right? And if the timestamp is, you know, greater than the timestamp of them, then, you know, I'm going to just, like, send them the reply that, okay, you, you asked it ahead of me. Again, the timestamp is logical, but, again, logically, it's as if they have asked first. So, they have the dibs, I, I have to wait, and I have to, you know, give them the thumbs up. Otherwise, I'm going to just, like, you know, wait for my own request to come back from everyone else, and then, basically, uh, don't reply to them. Because on the other hand, when I have my timestamp and their timestamp, they will also have my timestamp and their timestamp. So they will be tell, they will be also be able to tell that I have requested first. So they will give me times, uh, thumbs up. There won't be a deadlock. I mean, there, there are chances of, you know, and then you have to like solve it, but timeouts are, but this is at least a simple idea. Okay? So, if P1 sends a message request to P2 and P3 with timestamp 10, and then at the same time, or at the same time, P3 sends a request to P1 and P2, right, with the timestamp of 4. So, what's going to happen is that, so, P2 doesn't want to, like, enter their critical section. They're not in the middle of their critical section. So, they're going to uh, send OK to both of them. Now, P1 receives the P3 request with timestamp of 4 because their timestamp is 10 and... The, uh, the, the other one is 4, so it seems that they have priority, so P1 will wait and then send the OK to P3. On the other hand, P3 receives the P1 message. They want to enter their uh, critical section with a timestamp of 4. The other one wants to enter their critical section with a timestamp of 10. So, I have requested first, so I'm not going to give you OK. Uh, I will receive your OK and then move on. After I'm done, I'm going to just like, you know, release it send you the okay, and everything else. So this is the fully distributed. Again, everyone is waiting for everyone's permission. Any question in this one? Okay. So the problem with, the, with this is um, you have to know the identity of all the other processes in the system. It's not just like the central, uh, centralized uh, approach that you only need to you know, know the central coordinator. You have to know everyone because now you have to send the message to everyone and wait for everyone, right? And also, it makes it difficult to add or remove processes. Or what, if a, what happens if a process fails and doesn't answer? So you think that they want to enter the critical section, and then you wait, and then they're not there, right? So uh, some, some way to do it is just like with sending heartbeats. 
messages like every second or every few seconds you send that, hey, I'm available, hey, I'm alive, hey, I'm alive. So after some point you don't receive a message from someone, then you know that, okay, they failed, so I'm not going to listen or wait for them. I'm not going to send messages to them for now. You just like keep on moving, right? So uh, it's like more suitable for, you know, when you, when you have like uh, stable uh, processes. Uh, but it's going to be difficult when you have like, you know, nodes who are failing, and, you know, randomly. Uh, now, a token passing approach is, uh, I think, a different approach which uh, uses a logical ring, uh, like the ring of structure that we, uh, we just saw a few, uh, a few slides ago. And there is a, the only thing that you need, you don't need to know the identity of everyone. You only need to know your left and right. And then, basically, uh, the, there's always uh, like one direction. So, messages come from this, and then I'm going to pass the message to this, right? And then it goes back. Now, if my left, you know, fails, then I, there's, there should be a way to know who, who's their left, so that the ring stays stable. Or if my right fails, I should be able to send a message to the next one. So, that's different. But, like, assuming that the, lo the logical ring exists, the token is like the microphone, right? You, whoever, like, has it, has the dips. So, if I don't want to enter my critical section, I'm just going to pass it. They're going to pass it. They're going to pass it. So, if you want to, like, uh, enter your critical section, you just, like, have to wait so that the token, is, you know, is passed to you. Then you keep it instead of passing, enter your critical section, finish, and then pass on the token, right? That's easy to understand, and uh, it's just, like, two types of uh, uh, failures. Uh, what happens if the, uh, the token itself is lost? So, then you have to, like, start the, you know, the election process again. Or when uh, processes are failed, you have to establish a new ring. Again, you have to be able to find each other and so on. So, um, again, each of them, they're not like, you know, perfect or anything. No, they all have issues for themselves. We, we're just like getting, you know, introduced to each of them and uh, the, the differences between them. All right? Any questions in the ring approach? Okay, so election algorithms. So whatever happens, there are chances that a process, or let's say a coordinator, maybe you're not like, you know, even in, not in the centralized approach for mutual exclusion, you might still have a coordinator so that you can at least, you know, uh, inquire the list of available processes, right? So I don't know who are the processes, so I'm asking the coordinator who are the processes so I can send them messages, right? Uh, if I fail, when I, like, come alive, I only contact the coordinator that, hey, you know, I'm alive, so let the others know that I'm here, so if they want to, like, send a message or bring me back to the ring, whatever, right? So you might need, still need a, a coordinator. And uh, the election algorithm is basically for that. Now, the assumption is that there are priorities for different processes. For the simplicity in our examples, we just, like, assume the numbers of uh, processes are the priorities, and so the coordinator is usually uh, the process with the higher, highest priority. Now the problem is, again, if processes fail and come back, there is a chance that the coordinator itself fails. When a process comes alive, they don't know who is the coordinator, who is the highest priority. And also there's a, there's a chance that a new uh, like process is, is added with a higher priority. So because of these, you should be able to always find the highest priority process, which is the coordinator, right? Uh, so there are two algorithms. One is bully and the other one is ring. Again, this ring is different than the other one. Just don't confuse them. But two different algorithms for electing a coordinator. Okay? You got the idea for co what is the coordinator? The need for a coordinator. And there's always, you know, a process that you might need to, uh, like, have everyone be able to tell or communicate with them. Uh, not maybe for every message, but at least uh, for some, I don't know, controlling or basically coordinating, right? So the bully algorithm, as it says, is just like bullying, right? So everyone claims, and then whoever has, the, you know, the strongest or basically the highest priority wins, right? So the idea is basically, uh, uh, it, it, it should be able to, that you can send messages to every other processes, either directly or indirectly, right? So as long as you can send your voice to the others, and they can reply to you, then the bully algorithm can be implemented, right? So, uh, if, if a process has a timeout for the coordinator, and then, or they come alive, they don't know the coordinator or whatever, they assume that the coordinator has failed, and they, they start the election process, 
right? The election process starts by, uh, you know, a process sending an election message to every process with the higher priority number. So they know their own higher priority number. They, they, they know their own priority number, right? So if a priority of this process is five, then they know, okay, we have maybe, I don't know, 20 processes in the system. So I'm going to send message to six all the way to 20 and ask if you are alive, if you are the coordinator or no. So if I don't receive the responses from them, then I will assume that, okay, I'm going to be the coordinator because I'm, you know, higher than everyone else, right? So then I'm just going to, you know, elect myself. Now, if answer is received, then... Is gonna, I, 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 let's say I receive a message from process 15. Then I'm going to wait. Okay, process 15 exists, but are they the coordinator or not? So I'm going to wait for, you know, some other T, uh, T prime time. And then if, the, if the, I receive a co- who, who is the coordinator message, then I will, uh, you know, pick them. Otherwise, I, I'm, not st- I'm still confused. So I'm just going to start over the election process again. So there are uh, if uh, if you are the coordin- if you are not if you are the coordinator basically you are you will be the highest number already right if you are not at, at any time you might receive one of the following two messages let's say process number 10 either they receive that the pj is the new coordinator so process number 10 receives a message that okay process 15 is the no, new coordinator they'll accept it i mean they're weaker they're fine okay or they actually receive uh, from a smaller number that the, you know, the start, uh, election has started. So when I'm five, I will send messages to six to 20, right? All of them that, hey, I want to start an election. So process 10 will receive my message that, oh, process five wants to start an election, but I'm number 10. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to bully them, right? So they're going to actually reply to me that, no, shh, you stay down. I'm like higher than you. You're not going to get elected. That's it. And then this is the way that's going to happen. Every process can like start their election and then whoever has higher priority will reply to them that no, you're not the highest, just keep it silent. And then whoever is like basically the highest priority will get to elect themselves. Right? So, uh, the pro- and then uh, when a process like, you know, recovers from failure, it's just like uh, this, you start the election algorithm, you'll get to know the, you know, and after some messages, you'll, you'll know who is the coordinator. And again, once you start the election process, basically the coordinator has to prove themselves again, right? Because it has to like, send the message to everyone that I'm the coordinator, right? Uh, <clears throat> That's about it, right? So, the problem with this is, uh, like, let's see an example. So, like, process number four starts the election. Let's say they, they come alive, and then they start the election. So, they send messages to five, six, and seven. Now, the seven is not there, I mean, not there, so, it, because the, the reason was basically seven was a coordinator, but now four realized that seven is dead. So, because there is no coordinator, four is going to start a new election process. Five and six will respond to it that, no, you, you stay down. And then five starts their own election. They're going to say, you know, I'm going to be elected. And then again, six will going to say to five that, no, you're not. And then six will send its own message to everyone that, yeah, I'm going to be coordinator. So this is the way this one. So we're going to cover the ring algorithm next session, but let's finish up the bully algorithm. So in best case scenario, if the second to highest coordinator high priority starts the election, no one will respond to it and then it will be just like, you know, electing itself, right? So, it's just like, you know, easy. But in the worst case, if process number one starts the election, then everyone will say that, Shh, no, you're not. And then process number two starts the election and say, everyone, no. And then number three. So, there's just like the uh, almost N squared messages, you know, generated in order to, you know, everything settles down. Okay, so we're going to cover ring, uh, ring algorithm next session. Make sure you uh, submit your design document this Friday and your homework, bring it on next Tuesday. All right?